if I'm sharing it. Hopefully. Everything is fine. Okay, brilliant. Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll set, set off then. Um, in a letter written on the 27th of May, 1589, William Cecil, Lord Burley, the most powerful politician in England under Queen Elizabeth I, summarised the state of late Elizabethan European politics. The state of the world is marvellously changed, he wrote, when we true Englishmen have cause for our own quietness to wish good success to a French king and a king of Scots. And yet they both differ one from the other in profession of religion. But seeing both our enemies to our enemies, we have cause to join we to them in their actions against our enemies. Burley's assessment emphasized just how much the international status quo had changed over the course of Elizabeth's reign. For centuries, the principal threat posed to England came from the old alliance between France and Scotland. This anti-English arrangement had been renewed as recently as 1558, when Mary, Queen of Scots, married Francis' son to King Henry II of France. In an effort to counter this Franco-Scottish alliance, England had, since at least the 14th century, looked to have formed close ties with the kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula. In Tudor history, ties had been reinforced by the Treaty of Medina del Campo of 1489, which had tied the first Tudor king, Henry VII, to um, Isabella of Castile and her husband, Ferdinand of Aragon. Tudor ties to Iberia had been further strengthened by the marriage of Henry's eldest son, Arthur, to Catherine of Aragon, and then, after Arthur's death, of the younger son, who would become Henry VIII to Catherine. The climax of this Anglo-Spanish relationship had come in the mid 1550s, when Mary Tudor had married Philip II of Spain. This marriage had completed the Habsburg encirclement of France. Philip II ruled in Spain, in the Netherlands, he ruled various um, Italian states and with Mary in England, whilst his uncle Ferdinand was Holy Roman Emperor and thus was the dominant figure in much of what is today Germany. Mary's untimely death in 1558 was a setback for this Anglo-Spanish relationship, but both Philip and the new queen Elizabeth found the Franco-Scottish link to be a continued threat, so they were willing to put aside um, their religious differences. In the early years of the reign, William Cecil, for example, took, quote, comfort in the earnest and very brotherly friendship of Philip. Philip, meanwhile, despite being a Catholic and Elizabeth a Protestant, um, protected Elizabeth from papal excommunication until 1570. And even after this point, continued to make peaceful comments about England, both to his own ministers and to Elizabeth herself. Whilst it's commonly thought that, that the religious differences between England and Spain put the two countries on an inevitable path to conflict in, in, during this period, this was far from the case, at least as long as France remained a clear and present danger to both countries. The, cap, the collapse of Valois authority in, fifth, in the winter of 1584 to 85 opened the door to war, as it meant that France no longer posed this by 1585, Philip um, had ordered his, his um, generals and his um, naval commanders to begin preparations for the enterprise of England. And in 1588, the Spanish Armada set sail in its disastrous attempt to invade England. Burley may have felt that the state of the world has marvelously changed, but this was not a universally accepted worldview. A vocal minority of English men and women continued to view Spain as their country's greatest ally. These men and women were Catholics and their worldview was shaped by their faith. They were unconvinced that a purely religious solution such as missionary activity would successfully restore Catholicism in England. And so they believed that a political and a military solution was necessary. They looked to Spain 
as Spain was the foremost Catholic power at this time. So they, they lobbied Spain to um, commit political and military resources towards the restoration of English Catholicism. A Spanish invasion of England, from this perspective, was not motivated by hatred or dynastic rivalry or imperial expansion, but out of a sense of Christian duty and brotherly love. The impact on early modern politics and international relations had by English Catholics has long been overlooked by historians. For a long time, English history and English Catholic history have been viewed as completely separate entities with minimal overlap. Moreover, English Catholicism's international dimensions have been downplayed by historians who have preferred to present um, English Catholicism as separate from its European counterparts. Radicals and extremists, such as those who tried to blow up Parliament on the 5th of November 1605, have been downplayed as, repre as representative of English Catholics. Instead, a, um, a, the more popular representation of this community has been of them being apolitical and disengaged from politics. As a result, focus has uh, dwelt on the religious aspects of this community. It is focused on the devotion of missionaries to their, to their faith in the face of torture and even death. In short, there's been a tendency to view English Catholics as religious figures rather than as political figures in the 16th century. In this talk, um, though, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the tangible impacts that English Catholics had on international relations and uh, military events in the late 16th century. I'm going to do this by looking at the, at the role of a small group of English Catholics, um, the role they had as spies and intelligences. I'll start the talk by looking at early modern espionage in general, um, before turning to why, asking the question, why Philip II of Spain looked to English Catholics to provide him with English intelligence. I'll then give an overview of the Catholic spy network, which provided this intelligence, before looking at the important role of intelligence in the Anglo-Spanish War. Espionage has existed for millennia. There are references to it in the Old Testament and in Roman and Greek histories, but it was in the 16th century that uh, in intelligence workers reached new heights of professionalism and competence that enabled um, um, spycraft to become an essential tool of governance. And it was in this period that um, um, espionage really integrated itself into, into society more broadly. As, as we can see through these uh, three pictures on the screen. Uh, the, on the left, we have a picture of Elizabeth I, the rainbow portrait. And on it, on her gown, the orange gown, you can see eyes and ears representing her government's all seeing, all hearing nature. In the middle, we have a woodcut in a Venetian palace of a spy. Whilst on the right, we have a picture taken from a 16th century book of a spy. And like in the rainbow portrait, you can see eyes and ears on the gown. Espionage really became a part of fabric and people knew that it was occurring. Across Europe, states uh, developed extensive intelligence apparatus to provide this intelligence. And at the center of these apparatus were embassies and ambassadors. As, as the historian Michael Levin summarizes, quote, ever since the development of permanent embassies, states and statesmen have understood that ambassadors act as political analysts, as well as outright spies. Whichever state they were reporting back to, ambassadors sent regular reports back to their, their, their governments, who would then use this information to construct their policies. The reports sent back include diver, di, um, diverse information, ranging from relatively mundane um, factors um, through to, um, to sensitive state, state secrets. To aid them in this activity, uh, ambassadors were given uh, special funds to um, allow them to employ spies and informers and to make well-placed bribes to obtain information. 
Spanish um, ambassadors were no different. Uh, when Philip uh, appointed Guzman de Silva as his ambassador to Venice, for example, he gave Guzman um, the following instructions. Quote, to know and understand through all possible ways, means and forms, the news available to you. And Philip commanded him to develop a local network of agents. Ambassadors were the linchpin around which the entire system worked. They were expected to serve as something like station chiefs today, um, where they operated local networks reporting back to the center. And this was the case um, with Spain's ambassadors to England as well. The picture on the board is of Bernardino de Mendoza, who was uh, ambassador to England from 1578. Mendoza understood well the expectations Philip had of him when it came to matters of intelligence. And he filled his letters to Philip with vast amounts of intelligence relating to for English foreign relations, uh, domestic policies, um, the religious situation in the country, military developments, um, the location of troops, for example, um, as well as plenty of social commentary and, and gossip and rumours from court. However, in 1584, Mendoza was expelled from England and diplomatic ties between Spain and England were cut. This expulsion occurred because Mendoza was um, accused of participating in the Frockmorton plot, a, a Catholic conspiracy to um, depose Elizabeth and replace her on the throne with Mary, Queen of Scots, a Catholic alternative. Mendoza was reassigned to France to serve as ambassador there, but he was expected to continue to provide intelligence from England. To do this, he used the network which he had developed whilst in England, but he also developed new connections, for instance, with the English Catholic exile community living in France and in Flanders. He also made connections at the French court with influential ministers who were able to provide him with the latest intelligence that French agents had been able to gather. Um, he, um, he also um, connected to merchants traveling in and out of England. And in a real um, accomplishment, he even turned the English ambassador to France into a double agent. Um, and this was particularly useful as he was able to, um, this ambassador, Stafford, was able to provide um, the latest information from England about court politics, for example, but he was also able to provide false information going the other way. And this would be um, important in the run-up to the Spanish Armada. Stafford provided um, information, incorrect, in, deliberately incorrect information about the target of the Armada. So for instance, in May, 1588, just as the, the Armada was making its final preparations to set sail, um, Stafford sent a letter to the Elizabethan regime arguing that the, um, the, Armada was, that the Armada could not be destined for England on account that in a meeting he had had with Mendoza, he had seen a letter on, um, left um, on display on Mendoza's desk which said that the Armada was destined for England. Stafford argues that any um, letter left in such a prominent position must have been put there deliberately, intended to deceive and mislead of those who saw it. So on account of this, it must be destined to somewhere other than England. However, after the Armada, uh, Mendoza's network for gathering English intelligence began to collapse. Stafford began to um, become uncooperative, refusing to um, provide information to Mendoza. And then in, a, um, in late September, 1588, Henry, um, the King of France, performed what has been described by historians as an abrupt palace coup. He dismissed all his chief ministers and replaced them with men who, who can be characterized by their loyalty to him. These men were unwilling to share French intelligence with Mendoza. So Mendoza was deprived of another source of intelligence. And then the French wars of religion further um, undermined Mendoza's ability to develop 
um, and, um, and, um, and gather English intelligence. The assassination of Henri in uh, 1589 um, meant that there was a, a serious chance that a Protestant, Henri of Navarre, um, that there was a real chance that he would take control and France descended into religiously motivated wars. These cut Mendoza off from his, um, his, connect, his, um, his uh, contacts in England, and he was unable to replace them and develop new links because of the conflict. War made the communication line, lines unreliable. So Mendoza was unable to provide English intelligence, and the devastating effect this had was, um, was hammered home to Philip when, in 1589, England att um, attacked Spain in the English Armada, twice landing an expeditionary force on Spanish soil. Whilst this attack on Spain was a disaster, for want of a better way of putting it, it hammered home the importance of good and accurate intelligence. Since his usual uh, sources of intelligence could not be relied upon to gather this intelligence. An alternative outside the usual structures had to be found. And in 1590, Philip appointed a Welshman named Hugh Owen to provide this intelligence. So who was Owen and why did Philip turn to him to provide this intelligence? Owen was born in 1538 at Plas a farmhouse on the remote Clin Peninsula in northwest Wales. And um, this uh, picture here is Plas today. Um, some of the original building still stands, but unfortunately it's on the other side of the building from the pictures which are available. Um, but it's, it's still there today. Um, and um, I don't know if my mouse can be seen, but um, the Clin Peninsula is just under Anglesey and it's um, that prominent um, peninsula sticking out in the northwest corner of Wales. And this is a map drawn in part by Hugh Owen, um, who he was helping Humphrey Lloyd uh, contribute a map to an atlas of the world. Um, so from this map, you might um, be able to infer that Clin is a very remote corner. It's uh, shielded from the rest of England and Wales by the Snowdonia mountain range. And this had a profound impact on uh, Hugh Owen's upbringing. It meant it was a very conservative area and it was not really touched by the Protestant reforms which were taking place in the rest of the country. And Plas Du was a particularly uh, Catholic area of a particular, particularly Catholic corner of the country. Of uh, Hugh's uh, siblings, the eldest, Thomas, was accused of hiding Catholic priests in the family home in the 1570s, whilst two of his siblings became Catholic priests. Hugh, meanwhile, turned to politics, believing that it was only through regime change that, um, that England and Wales could be saved from the experiment with Protestantism. So Owen um, studied law at Lincoln's Inn, and then he entered the service of Henry Fitzalan, the 12th Earl of Arundel. And in 1566, he accompanied Arundel on a tour of mainland Europe, during which he was introduced to many prominent English Catholic exiles who had fled the country on account of their faith. Soon after their return from mainland Europe, Arundel and Owen became um, entangled in the Rodolfi plot, a Catholic conspiracy to depose Elizabeth and to free Mary, Queen of Scots, from her captivity, where um, she was held in house arrest, having fled Scotland um, in 1567. Owen's involvement in the Rodolphi plot made him a marked man, and he fled into exile, joining um, those people he had, he had come into contact with a couple of years earlier in the Spanish Netherlands. Once there, Owen established himself as a trustworthy individual who was able to smuggle messages into and out of England with the assistance of his servant, a man named Parry. Now, from the surviving sources, we um, have a few, there are a few clues as to how they did this. Um, Parry is reported to have concealed messages in his riding rod, for example, 
or in the soles of his shoes. And on one occasion, when he um, thought that he was about to be arrested by the authority, he even ate a letter rather than let the, the authorities see what it contained. And over time, Owen developed this, uh, this, um, his abilities to smuggle information and letters into and out of the country into a, the early stages of an espionage network. Throughout the 1580s, Owen played an active role in conspiracies, um, through which we can see that his influence and petition, uh, position in the Catholic community in exile was, uh, was growing. For example, in 1584, he worked with the prominent English Jesuit, Robert Parsons, and the de facto leader of English Catholicism, William Allen, on a scheme to free Mary, Queen of Scots from captivity. This trio had been commissioned to do this work by Philip II, but they never really got anywhere with it because of the Frockmorton plot, which I mentioned earlier being the cause of the uh, expulsion of Bernardino de Mendoza. Nevertheless, we can see that uh, Owen was um, involved in these activities. Similarly, in 1587, he uh, attempted to coordinate a plot by Welsh soldiers in the English army in Flanders um, to betray the strategically important port of Ostend into Spanish hands. Um, so we see that he's involved in various plots and conspiracies, and these led him to uh, gaining the attention and the trust of the Spanish governor in the ne uh, Netherlands, Alessandro Farnese, the Prince of Parma. And in the late 1580s, um, Owen was responsible. He was, um, he was um, given the jo job by uh, Parma of vetting English and Welsh volunteers into S Spain's army of Flanders. And then when the um, plans for the Armada were being drawn up, there is evidence to suggest that Owen was heavily involved in the, this uh, planning. Um, unfortunately, the, the definitive evidence has been destroyed, but there is strong evidence to show that Palmer's plan, which he submitted to Philip as his suggestion for how to invade England, had been written by Owen. So Owen's uh, status in the exile community and at, um, with the Spanish authorities in the Netherlands um, came on account of his, uh, his abilities as, a, as an intelligencer, as a spy master. This is important. He wasn't um, getting this, in, uh, this status from his hereditary rights, like, for example, the Earl of Westmoreland, um, and these hereditary figures could be relied on in the event of a Spanish invasion to raise their uh, bannermen um, to support the invader. Nor was he a prominent politician like Sir Francis Englefield, who had served on Mary and Philip's Privy Council during their reign in the 1550s. It was, his, um, it was Owen's ability to obtain information from England which made him valuable. He was the figure who was able to smuggle correspondence undetected by the Elizabethan authorities. He was the figure who had a network at his disposal already. So in 1590, he was sent by Palmer to Spain to, um, to the court of Philip II. And it was on this trip um, that Philip made him his uh, ambassador for uh, his, uh, spy, his spy master specialising in English affairs. So before we zoom in on the impact that uh, Owen's intelligence had on military activities in the Anglo-Spanish War, I'd like to take a moment to explore Owen's intelligence network, looking at a couple of key figures who, um, who uh, reveal a lot about how intelligence was gathered. So the first figure I'd like to discuss is Richard Verstegen. Richard Verstegen was a English Catholic of Dutch de descent who lived in Antwerp and he worked closely with Owen. Um, surviving sources, we can see that Owen um, and Verstegen were often in, in um, communication with each other. They often visited each other's houses and they were involved in very similar lines of work. And so it's, it's, it's very tempting to argue that they were collaborating with each other. 
So Versigan um, acted as a vital intermediary in Catholic communication across the channel. He received letters and he forwarded them on to their destinations. He was particularly involved with the Jesuit mission in England and was in contact in the 1590s with three, possibly four Jesuit missionaries in England itself. These three were uh, uh, Henry Garnet, Robert Savill, and John Gerard. And he had other contacts as well who are closely tied to the Jesuit mission. Um, for example, um, he, uh, we know through another Jesuit, Henry Walpole, that Verstegen was in collaboration with Robert Spiller, who was steward to Anne Howard, Countess of Arundel, a powerful uh, English uh, Catholic widow who used her position to protect, protect missionaries and Catholics in general. So through these missionaries and through Spiller and through uh, Howard, uh, the Countess of Arundel, uh, Verstegen received information from the networks and the contacts that these figures had in England. And from the information he received, he uh, produced weekly reports, which he sent to Robert Parsons, who was based in Spain, and to Roger Baines, who was William Allen's secretary in Rome. Verstegen's reports contained five main sorts of information. News directly relating to the um, mission itself, um, reporting about the whereabouts of missionaries and what they had been up to, as well as um, information about if they'd been captured or if they'd been executed for their activities in England. There was also information relating to the general political situation in England, as, um, as well as uh, reviews and summaries of the latest anti-Catholic books, declarations, policies and proclamations uh, issued by the Elizabethan regime. In addition, there, um, there was information about the um, politics and situation in the Netherlands, particularly where it related to the English Catholic community. So alongside these reports, Verst consent to pa uh, Robert Parsons in particular, numerous documents, including copies of uh, Lord Burley's uh, letters, which had been taken from his desk, as well as English Protestant books. These books and letters allowed Parsons to stay up to date with what was going on in England, as well as to uh, produce uh, uh, responses, which Verstegen then um, published. And on the screen, we have a picture taken from one of Verstegen's publications uh, for, um, of uh, Robert Parsons' works. Um, as well as publishing them and printing these books, Verstegen uh, arranged for the books to be smuggled into England. As well as smuggling uh, books, Verstegen was also involved in smuggling people into England. And we, can, um, we, we see him acting as a final resting space for missionaries before they went into England. In doing this work, we... Uh, he was helped by at least two individuals. Uh, one was Gab Gabriel Colford, who was condemned to torture in Bridewell Prison for smuggling books uh, he had received from Verstegen. Whilst the other was Cornelius Valtus, a Fleming who was banished from England after several years in jail for the same offence. Given their roles in smuggling texts into England, it's, um, it's highly likely that Owen uh, they were also smuggling letters, books, and documents for Owen, as well as Verstegen, given how Owen and Verstegen, um, we can see um, from other sources that they collaborated with each other and shared intelligence and information. Now, the uh, other couple of people which I'd like to uh, talk about in Owen's network are two figures called William Sturrell and Thomas Phillips. And these were um, possibly the two most useful sources for Owen in England itself. Thomas Phillips was a career spy and he built his reputation as an expert cryptographer. A cryptographer is someone who specializes in decoding co um, messages. Um, and his uh, most famous instant of decoding had become in 1587 when he had been working for Sir Francis Walsingham 
who's sometimes been referred to as Elizabeth's spymaster. In 1587, Philippe's um, decoded this message, which is at the top on the right of the screen there. And it's a letter um, which, which, having been um, translated, was used to, uh, as the damning evidence um, as, uh, of proof of Mary Queen of Scots involvement in the Babington plot, a plot to um, depose Elizabeth and put her on the throne. So you might be thinking, what was uh, Thomas Phillips, someone who's so clearly aligned with the Protestant regime, um, what, what, why would he become involved in supplying intelligence to Hugh Owen, who was then in, um, uh, providing it to Spain, England's principal enemy? In a nutshell, the answer is simple. He needed money. Following Sir Francis Walsingham's death in April 1590, espionage um, in England entered a period of uh, uh, contraction. Over the previous two decades, uh, Walsingham had used his position as Secretary of State to build an extensive and elaborate spy network which crossed Europe and provided with him with huge amounts of intelligence. But this had come at a huge financial cost and he ended his life in immense debt. When um, he died, his duties and responsibilities were passed to Lord Burley, who was also serving as Lord High Treasurer for Elizabeth. And Burley um, assessed the situation and Walsingham's networks. And with his uh, treasurer's cap on, he thought that it was costing far too much and that not all the spies and informers and agents on Walsingham's payroll were providing true value for money. So he, uh, um, he decided to embark on a policy of cost cutting. And Philippe's was one of those who didn't make the cut. Philippe's, though, was very aware of what his skills were, and he believed that there would be someone who would use them. Um, he tried to catch the attention of another uh, figure within the Elizabethan regime, as multiple figures, um, multiple councillors employed their own networks of one size or another. Um, he had limited success until he approached the Earl of Essex in the early 1590s. Uh, Essex was a relative newcomer in the Elizabethan government, and he was still looking for a niche in which he could prove himself and really uh, attract the attention of Elizabeth. And so he was approached by Philips um, with a proposal. We can provide you with intelligence, Philips would have argued, um, and we can provide intelligence of Catholic conspiracies and activities, and you can use this to um, advance your position. And this, um, this appealed to Essex. Other figures such as Burley and Walsingham had advanced their, their positions at court at one time or another using exactly this technique. It was a proven strategy. Um, so Philippe's found employment with Essex. One of the agents that Philippe's was able to go to Essex with was William Sturrell. Um, Sturrell um, was secretary to the Earl of Worcester, a powerful nobleman with Jesuit sympathies. Um, Philippe, Philippe's had been aware of Sorel since at least 1585, when he had observed Sorel working with the French ambassador. Um, Sterel, under the uh, alias Kirby, had been, quote, one of the chiefest familiars with Monsieur Mauvissier for all actions of the Scots Queen, and also in all matters of weight concerning the Papists in England. Over the years that had followed, Philippe's had monitored Sturrell, observing his communication with uh, Catholic exiles in the Netherlands. And in the, and in the winter of 1590 to 91, he had approached Sturrell, um, hoping to exploit Sturrell's connections into the exile community um, to learn any plans and conspiracies which were being drawn up. Philippe's was unaware though, that Sturrell saw in this uh, approach an opportunity to advance the Catholic cause. 
Storrell initially corresponded with uh, Thomas Fitzherbert, who would go on in the later 1590s to become Philip II's secretary for English affairs. And with uh, Richard Sherwood, who was a chaplain in the English regiment in the army of Flanders. And by 1592, Storrell's contacts amongst the exiles had expanded to include Hugh Owen and Richard Verstegen. For his connections um, in government, which included Essex and Worcester um, and Thomas Phillips, Sturrell was able to provide intelligence uh, from the heart of the Elizabethan regime to these exiled um, intelligences. But he was also providing intelligence the other way, much as Mendoza had used the English ambassador to France in the run up to the Armada. Um, so the information which um, Owen and Verstigan provided Sturrell it was carefully chosen to advance Sturrell's uh, credentials as a useful source of intelligence about Catholic activities. But it also was carefully chosen so that it minimized um, the damage um, to the Catholic cause. So for example, it might be a, a moment out of date. So it's uh, up to date enough so that um, those receiving it would think this is good intelligence, it's unfortunate. Um, it hadn't arrived a day or two sooner. And this is a classic strategy in counterintelligence. As uh, Hank Prunkham writes, counterintelligence, quote, calls for the engineering of complex strategies that deliberately put one's agents in contact with an adversary's intelligence personnel. This is done so that an adversary can be fed with disinformation, which will hopefully lead to confusion, thus disrupting the adversary and allowing the perpetrator to prosper. So through William Sturrell, Owen was able to acquire a well-placed triple agent. That is a double agent pretending to be um, uh, in, uh, working for one side, while in fact working as a double agent for the other. Now returning to Philippe's, um, in the first half of the 1590s, uh, Thomas Philippe's worked for Essex. But um, he was unable to provide the real uh, intelligence coup, which would be able to advance Essex's position at court. And Essex, wanting quick results, grew frustrated. Um, he had spent a lot of money on, um, on this intelligence ring run by Philippe's, um, but had yet to see results. So he um, uh, withdrew himself from intelligence and instead focused on military activities, which we will uh, come to later in the talk. But this left um, Phillips um, without a patron. And a patron is um, at this time was extremely useful. As if he uh, uh, um, annoyed someone the wrong way, um, he, it was well known that he was in contact with English Catholics. And it would have been possible for a rival at court to produce evidence um, saying that, the, uh, that he was in contact with traitors, thereby damning him by association. A patron pro um, offered protection from this sort of attack. Um, so in the, um, so in the, by the mid 1590s, uh, Philippe was in need of a patron, but he was also in need of money as he was running a network uh, at, at um, immense personal cost. And Sturrell was able to approach uh, Philippe's um, with an offer, um, I, um, an offer of uh, patronage through Worcester, but also of money. And in the uh, uh, around 1600, when Philippe's was arrested for um, his um, relationship and uh, communication with Catholic exiles, he was able to draw on this patronage to um, escape trial and um, potential execution for treason. Um, so through Thomas uh, Phillips and William Sturrell, Owen had uh, contacts deep within the Elizabethan regime who were able to provide information from the heart of what was going on there. And the, um, so they, they may well have been those who were able to provide letters from uh, copies of letters from Lord Burley's desk, for example. Um, so the information which Owen gathered from a variety of sources, he uh, collated into reports, which he then sent to Spain. 
these uh, documents were entitled Avisos de Inglaterra or Avisos de Londres. And we can see three examples on the screen here. Uh, now, uh, these um, reports haven't been studied by historians previously. Um, and this can be explained for a couple of reasons. The first of, of, of this is the, the classic, all the classic tropes about English speakers uh, not being good at foreign languages. Um, these, le these intelligence reports were written in Spanish um, and therefore are inaccessible to those who don't have the language. The other reason why these reports haven't been looked at previously is on, on account of their archival location. They're held at the Archivo General de Simancas. And this archive um, uh, hasn't really entered uh, the uh, historian's attention. And this is partly because it hasn't been extensively catalogued. So there are no um, historians want, um, wanting to study in the English in Spain um, cannot look in advance before attending, meaning that any trip they go is inherent, inherently speculative. Moreover, these are visos because they came to Spain via Hugh Owen, who was in Antwerp. Um, they're found in the Flanders volumes um, at Simancas rather than the English volumes. So anyone looking for material relating to England may end up missing them because they're, in, they're looking in the wrong volumes. The results though of this, uh, of this um, um, the result though of um, historians not engaging with these documents is that they haven't featured in our understanding of the Anglo-Spanish War. We don't have time um, today for me to go through every intelligence document um, but I want to just draw attention to um, the benefit that we can gain on, for our understanding of the Anglo-Spanish War by looking at a couple of years in particular. These years are 1595 to 97, years in which the war was fought with renewed vigour. England uh, um, sent raids um, and expeditions um, to invade Spain, and Spain did the same. Um, these years are generally forgotten about in general, with attention instead uh, dwelling on the Spanish Armada of 1588. Um, so by, um, by looking at this period, we get a new sense of, uh, of what was going on. And it really emphasizes how the conflict didn't end in 1588, which it often does in popular perceptions of the war. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is talk about these couple of years um, and really emphasizing the role of intelligence in shaping the, uh, the military um, event, um, battles and campaigns of this period. So in the early 1590s, the Anglo-Spanish War had primarily been a land-based war closely linked to the Dutch revolt against Spanish rule in the Netherlands and the French wars of religion. The assassination of Henri III of France in 1589 and the subsequent collapse of the Catholic position in France had forced Spain to abandon um, its war against England directly. Um, so rather than uh, send a second armada in 1589 or 1590, all its military resources were redirected to France. England didn't, in these early years, didn't uh, attack Spain uh, itself, but instead it used its uh, army to bolster the Dutch uh, forces and the French forces fighting against Spain. They acted as a reserve uh, force able to um, reinforce areas where it looked like Spain would, were, was about to make a breakthrough, or they were used as an offensive force to take advantage of um, Spanish weakness. By 1595, though, the nature of the, um, the war was changing. The Dutch and the French Protestants uh, were in ascendancy. The Spanish position in France uh, had collapsed in, in 1594 with the last uh, Spanish stronghold in Brittany um, falling into French hands. 
Meanwhile, in the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch had taken control of all the territories north of the Rhine. So given these developments, England looked to shift its strategy. A uh, rebellion against English rule in Ireland had started in 1593. So uh, the army was redirected uh, west into to fighting this conflict there. And um, in terms of the war directly against Spain, um, England looked to engage in more naval activities. So the first of these, which was commissioned, was the Drake Hawkins expedition, um, which had been in the works for a while, um, with at one stage being a plan to attack Panama and disrupt the Spanish supply of um, South American silver. But when, uh, when it was finally approved in uh, 1595, um, the idea was to uh, attack Puerto Rico and to uh, capture a Spanish treasure ship, a ship which it, English intelligence said had been um, uh, stranded there. Elizabeth ordered the uh, expedition to take no longer than six months. The thinking was to maximize the chance of profits through the capture of the Spanish treasure ship, whilst minimizing the time that England's, um, England's coast was undefended by these ships. Um, on the 28th of August, 1595, Drake and Hawkins set sail, taking 27 ships with them, the six largest of which were supplied by Elizabeth herself. Whilst Drake and Hawkins were raiding the Spanish New World, another English force was being assembled. And the aim of this fleet was a direct raid against Spain itself. This operation started off as a primarily naval um, activity under the command of Lord Admiral Charles Howard. But when the Earl of Essex, who's on the screen there, um, was appointed co-commander in 1596, its nature changed. The expeditionary force um, grew substantially with Essex personally paying for the wages of a thousand men and providing an additional company of a hundred lancers. And in addition to these paid soldiers, he also persuaded hundreds of gentlemen volunteers to sign up without pay. The fleet also grew with Dutch, with Dutch uh, soldiers and ships joining the fleet. And this, uh, this attack was monitored um, by the Avizos sent to Spain by Owen. These Avizos um, detailed the fleet's preparations but they struggled to identify what the target of this expedition actually would be. At different times, the Avizos claimed that the raid was going to take place to attack Spanish, the Spanish fleet in harbors in A Coruña, Lisbon, Cadiz, Seville, the major Spanish uh, ports. This might sound like a failure of intelligence, but the truth is that there wasn't a definitive target to, um, to attack. Uh, to identify, as it hadn't been agreed by the uh, expedition's commanders. Just as Essex and Howard prepared to set sail, Elizabeth came close to abandoning the whole expedition. In April and May 1596, the first survivors of the Drake Hawkins expedition returned, reporting a disaster which had claimed the lives of both commanders. Meanwhile, in France, the Spanish army had regrouped following its defeats in 1594 and 95. And having regrouped, the, the Spanish army had marched on Calais, besieging the city on 10th of April. A swift response was urgently required from England and Elizabeth ordered Essex and Howard to prepare a relief operation. An emergency levy was conducted to raise men for this relief army. And in London, this was conducted by locking the church doors following the start of the Easter Sunday service, a service in which the whole English population was legally required to attend. So under Essex and Howard, an army um, was gathered, ready to move to Calais to, um, to uh, attack the Spanish force there. But Elizabeth chose this moment to make demands of King Henri IV of France. In exchange for providing aid, Elizabeth 
demanded that the English take control of Calais. This demand probably stemmed from a mistrust of Henri. Henri had been a Protestant, but in 1594, to secure the French throne, he had uh, converted to Catholicism, and he supposedly had said that Paris is worth a mass. So Elizabeth probably feared that Henri would um, abandon his English allies if it was convenient for him. However, Henri refused to give in to Elizabeth's demands. And given the threat that uh, uh, the Spanish taking control of Calais posed to England, it, um, Elizabeth realized that she had to act regardless of concessions from Henri. So on the 23rd of April, she ordered Essex and Howard to set sail for Calais. This though was the same day as, Spanish, as the Spanish forces stormed um, the citadel in Calais, ending French resistance. News soon reached over and Essex abandoned the relief operation. He was extremely frustrated by this um, development and he implores Elizabeth to allow him to return to the original expedition which had been proposed. In France, he argued, Elizabeth was, quote, but an auxiliary or co adjudicator after the proportion of Switzerland or petite commonwealths. But in this, like a princess of power, you make the war yourself. Essex saw this as an opportunity for Elizabeth to assert herself militarily, to be a proactive participant rather than a reactive one. Elizabeth agreed to an aggressive strike against Spain. As she authorised it, the expedition would destroy the Spanish fleet in its harbours and seize as much plunder as could be found, whilst at the same time taking precautions to minimise the loss of men and vessels. So she forbade the, uh, the, uh, taking of, the attacking of towns which were able to defend themselves, for example. Essex, though, had other ideas. The Calais debacle had convinced him that Elizabeth was a liabil liability in matters of war. She was too indecisive in her opinion. So he drew up secret plans for a more bold strategy, which he did not share with the Privy Council or Elizabeth until after he had departed. His plan was to take a Spanish port and to garrison it with a force uh, capable of holding it. Um, so that it would be a thorn in, his, in Philip's foot, um, is the way he put it in, in the letter which revealed his plans to the Privy Council. The idea then was um, that this would prevent Spanish forces from uh, being sent to France or to England, but instead they would have to focus on retaking the town which Essex captured. The attempt to keep the fleet's intentions were a success, Whilst the Avisa sent to Spain by Owen um, kept Philip informed of Essex's preparations, um, they lacked the final destination uh, which, which was being targeted. Owen's Avisa uh, suggested that the likely target was Seville or Lisbon, which were the principal ports holding the, the Spanish Navy. So when um, the English fleet arrived at Cadiz on the 29th of June, it took the Spanish forces their surprise. They lacked the effective artillery and were short of ammunition and were generally ill-prepared to repel as the sizable force which arrived. They managed to repel the initial attack, but was soon overrun. So by viewing this, um, this attack through the lens of the Avisos sent to Spain by Owen, we can really appreciate the extent of the deception um, Essex managed to achieve. Not only did he keep his, uh, his um, intentions hidden from the Elizabethan regime, he ensured that he, the enemy was in the dark as well, meaning that he was successful in his initial objectives. However, his plans soon fell apart. Elizabeth was annoyed that he had gone off, um, off script um, and so refused to send reinforcements. Moreover, morale soon um, fell apart in, um, amongst his, his army. And so he was forced uh, to abandon um, Cadiz, having taken it, and return home. 
Philip's um, Philip's um, response to the humiliation of the English capture of Cadiz, though, um, meant that he refocused his attention, his military attentions towards England, and so decided to send an armada to support the Irish rebels fighting against English rule. Um, a fleet was hurriedly assembled in August and September of 1596, um, and um, it set sail in October. The English uh, did, um, did have intelligence that these preparations were coming, that, they, they, that this force was coming, um, but they didn't believe that uh, an expedition would occur so late in the year due to the bad weather which comes in autumn and early winter. Um, by the time they realised that it was indeed coming that autumn, um, the fleet, the English fleet had been decommissioned and was um, wintering in, um, in, Ch in Chatham. The fleet had to be recommissioned, but uh, unfavourable winds kept it pinned in the ports. Um, and so England's defences um, had to rely on the coastal defences and the trained bands of amateur militiamen, um, who Elizabeth's strategy, her entire um, reign, had been to try and avoid this line of defence being used, but instead keep the war at sea. Um, through the autumn, rumours abounded that uh, the Spanish force had um, successfully landed um, somewhere in Elizabeth's territories. But this was not the case. The same winds which prevented the Elizabethan fleet from setting sail also um, damaged the Spanish fleet. And on this map here, you can see the squiggly line um, by Portugal and, and Spain. And this is representative of the storms uh, which scattered the fleet and forced it to harbour in Ferro, um, having made it no further than northwest Spain. England had been spared by the weather. So storms may have um, destroyed the Elizabethan, uh, the, the Spain's uh, chances of invading um, Elizabethan territories in 1596, but um, the fleet was still there and still pose a very real threat to Elizabethan England. So Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth um, ordered that a fleet be um, gathered to destroy the Spanish Armada in its harbours. Um, this was following the logic that attack was the best form of defence. Uh, by mid-December, just a couple of months after the um, failure of the Second Spanish Armada, Q. Owen was sending reports to Spain that the Elizabethan fleet was being assembled and that it was going to number more than 300 vessels by Easter when it would set sail. These reports also noted that the Elizabethan regime was making requests to private individuals and groups, urging them to contribute ships to construct this fleet. It's kind of a form of crowdfunding of war. Um, however, these um, visas also reported that the, um, these requests were not being well received. The city of London, for example, cited poverty, claiming that they only had the resources to raise six ships far fewer than the Elizabethan regime hoped. Through the avisos sent by Owen, Philip was able to track the Elizabethan efforts to build an offensive fleet for a campaign against Spain. The Earl of Essex was given command of the Elizabethan fleet and was told to execute an ambitious plan. He was to destroy the Spanish fleet at Ferro before seizing a major Iberian port and using it as a base to neutralize Spanish sea power and blockade other Spanish ports. To this end, Essex was equipped with a small but highly trained and experienced army, consisting of 4,000 militiamen and 1,000 veterans recalled from the conflict in the Netherlands. Details of this, uh, this um, force were tracked with uh, remarkable accuracy in the Avizos. But just as the Spanish Armada of 1596 was um, thwarted by storms, so this English fleet was um, defeated by the weather as well. Storms damaged the ships, 
and a uh, contrary wind uh, forced the fleet to remain in harbour. Uh, faced with limited supplies, Essex was forced to uh, dismiss the 4,000 militiamen and um, reduce his um, plans. Um, no longer would they uh, intend to capture a port, instead they would look to destroy the Spanish fleet and raid in, um, Spanish shipping in the Atlantic. The fleet set sail in August 1597, but was again hit by storms almost immediately. And when they regrouped, they had already passed Cape Finisterre in northwest Spain. And easterly winds prevented them from heading towards Ferro. So instead, the fleet decided to abandon this part of their mission and instead focus on their second objective, raiding Spanish treasure ships in the Atlantic. And they sailed to the Azores to intercept any fleets they could find. Throughout this time, Spain had been preparing an armada of its own to sail to England. Through the armada, uh, through the Avizos, Philip was aware that the, the majority of Elizabeth's frontline fleet had departed with Essex. And he was also aware that this fleet had passed Spain and was heading to the Azores. He therefore realised, on account of this intelligence, that England was defenceless. He ordered the commander of his fleet, Martin de Padilla, to sail, set sail at once, rather than wait for the additional 32 ships and 5,000 men who were en route to joining them from Lisbon. So in total, the, the armada which set sail um, comprised of 136 ships, 9,000 soldiers and 4,000 sailors. And the plan was to take Falmouth in Cornwall so that it could be used as a beachhead for a subsequent full-scale invasion the following spring. Um, England was completely unaware that this fleet was coming. The Elizabethan regime presumed that Essex had attacked the uh, Spanish fleet and destroyed it in its harbours before moving on to the Azores. And it was only um, um, later that they realised that this hadn't occurred. Meanwhile, the Spanish fleet was sailing to England. And the first that the Elizabethan regime learned of this fleet was when um, the remains of the fleet began to wash up on the um, shore. There had been tremendous storms which had um, struck the fleet as it sailed past the Scilly Isles uh, off the uh, southwest coast of Cornwall. And some of the wrecks landed on the Cornish um, shores and the rest of the fleet was scattered. Um, England's defences were mobilised, but these, this occurred almost a week after the, the remnants of these uh, wrecks arrived on the shoreline. So the, uh, the, tre uh, the, um, the raising of the alarm was occurring far too late. It's um, very likely then that had storms not hit the Spanish fleet, that they would have successfully attacked um, the English defences at Falmouth, taking the port. Intelligent, ac accurate, and, um, accurate intelligence sent to Spain by Owen had meant that Philip had accelerated his, um, his invasion plans. Uh, whilst um, the lack of intelligence, um, which the Elizabethan regime had, meant that they were extremely vulnerable. Intelligence was a key part of the war and was integral in military campaigns in this period. So just to conclude, um, espionage was a essential tool of government in the 16th century um, Europe. States across um, the continent developed um, extensive intelligence apparatus, uh, the heart of which were ambassadors. In Spain, this was no different. Philip relied on his ambassadors to gain intelligence about rival states. However, from 1584, Philip lacked an ambassador in England. And the um, negative effect this had was really driven home by the English Armada of 1589. So Philip turned to a Elizabethan Catholic spy network to provide him with this intelligence. Um, this, this network was able to provide good 
and accurate intelligence at many times, which was integral to the sending of the third Spanish Armada in particular. But equally, when they struggled to gain the intelligence, they, um, it helped the Elizabethan regime's campaigns, such as at Cadiz in 1596. Intelligence was then a, an important part of Anglo-Spanish, um, the Anglo-Spanish War. And, and understanding it allows us to have a better sense of just how close England came to being invaded by Spain in the 1590s. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very thank much, Jonathan. As, um, as a very noted Englishman would say, all is well that ends well. So thank you again for this fascinating talk. And apologies to all for the technical failures earlier. It is the first time we experienced such problems, and I'm only glad that this was a, a Zoom talk and not the launching of a space mission. So, well, thanks for your patience, and as a means to compensate, Jimmy, I promise I will remain in perfect silence during our next um, British Spanish Society and Instituto Cervantes uh, conference. We do have some time now for a Q&A, so we will go ahead with that. Jonathan, if, if it's okay with you. Yes, of course. And um, so... Uh, Shirley uh, asks about Rui Lopez, uh, the Jewish conver conversor, a physician um, to Elizabeth I, um, executed, who was executed as a Spanish spy. Was he used as a red herring, like Dreyfus uh, was for Esther Hasse, to take the scent of the real Spanish spies at Elizabeth's court? <coughs> Excuse me. And that's the lingering COVID symptoms there. Um, I'm just glad I managed to make it through the majority of the talk without a, a big eruption. Um, the uh, the Rui Lopez is an interesting figure and the popular, uh, the most uh, popular um, theory about him is that he was a scapegoat, um, not for um, a, a decoy for um, detracting from the English uh, Catholic spies working for Spain or for any group like that, but instead was used by Essex to, um, to advance his cause at the English court. Um, Essex was able to point to this, um, this person coming from, from um, Philip II's territories and um, construct a plot around, around him. And then using torture, he forced Rui Lopez and those around, um, and those who were also implicated in the plot to confess to having participated. And this was used for by Essex to advance a particular political um, objectives that he had towards a more aggressive strategy towards Catholics and Spain in general. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, well, uh, also, um, Enrique asks, uh, how long did the reports take to reach uh, Philip II in El Escorial, and how were these uh, disseminated? How were they distributed? I don't know um, the exact time it would have taken for um, the reports to reach um, Spain off the top of my head. Um, it is something I've, I've noted down previously um, because some of the reports, um, they have a sent date and they also have a receipt date. Um, uh, written on them um, but off the top of my head I can't remember but it's um, often a couple of weeks at most these things were were very much um, taken as quick as they could um, it was very much known that um, time was of the essence with matters like this so they 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 put them on the fastest ships and sent them immediately rather than waiting um, and letting the information go out of date yeah. um, in terms of their distribution um, the reports which were sent to um, the Spanish regime, um, Philip II himself um, looked at them. He was um, notorious um, for, he's sometimes been referred to as the paper king on account of the number of documents which passed across his desk each day and uh, the, the amount of paperwork which his, um, he demanded that his ministers ge generate. Um, and some of the reports do have um, annotations written by Philip on them. Um, showing that he was reading them and also engaging with the uh, letters. Beyond him, um, they would also uh, most likely have gone to his Secretary of State 
And he had several in this period, um, including Juan de Dieca, um, who, um, who worked very closely with, um, with um, Philip in constructing Spain's foreign policies, particularly in Northern Europe. Good. Um, Elisa um, asks about the languages uh, that were used in uh, all the evidence and the written records you, you have been referring to during your talk. Um, so the avisos de Inglaterra themselves, the, the intelligence reports, they're written in Spanish um, for a Spanish audience. Um, they are sometimes coded, um, but they've been deciphered in Spanish um, for the reading of the, uh, by, by Philip II. Um, the intelligence itself coming out of England um, would often be written in English um, or, or French. Um, occasionally you see some, um, there would have been some Welsh as well, taking advantage of uh, Owen's um, of Welsh roots. Um, I've, I've, I haven't found any report, um, intelligence documents themselves written in Welsh, but there are letters written by Owen to his family members in Welsh, which show that he did speak the language. He is a impressive polyglot and spoke five, six languages. Um, there are equivalent documents also produced by Owen, um, sent for an audience in Rome, um, which are written in Italian, um, which just show the, the skill um, as a, a linguist. Yes, well, it's very, very impressive indeed, yes. Uh, Susanna White um, asks, are you aware of any females of any nationality involved in Spain for Spain? Um, I haven't found any yet involved in the core of this network, but what they are, were often able to do is provide important roles protecting um, Catholic spies and agents. Um, so for example, I mentioned the Countess of Arundel, Anne Howard, um, during the talk and uh, noted her role um, in relation to Richard Verstigan. Um, it was her steward who was uh, um, provided information to Verstigan amongst others. And um, Howard used her position both as a widow and as a noble lady um, to protect Catholics. Uh, widows had a um, slightly strange legal position in England, whereas a wife was expected to do as their husband um, commanded. Um, a widow had a greater degree of independence, but they were also still seen as a, as a woman and therefore um, lesser, for want of a better way of putting it. And this gave them greater freedom to, um, to follow their religious uh, beliefs and also to, um, as a powerful woman with plenty of money at her disposal, she was able to invest in building priest holes, for example, but also in um, supporting the network. Um, so she, you see people relating to her um, working very closely with the network. So whilst I haven't found any agents themselves who are women, actually I tell a lie, I have found one woman involved in the smuggling, um, uh, or if not a, um, a woman, then people dressed as women, hoping again to use, take advantage of the dismissal of women uh, by the Elizabethan authorities as a lesser um, a lesser threat compared to men. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. By the way, uh, there is a um, huge acclaim to, to your talk. Uh, uh, so congratulations for that. Uh, I think we have time for three uh, more questions. And Nigel asks, well, there is, a Spain, there is evidence here asserts that Spain was considering an invasion from Ireland. Did your research pick up on direct contact between the spies in England and Spanish agents in Ireland? I didn't look at this directly. However, there are another category of intelligence reports from Ireland itself um, in Samancas, which I did find, but unfortunately the restraints of time and space didn't allow me to investigate um, this um, net, the, the, the providers of the intelligence from Ireland. So there's potentially links going into Ireland. Certainly there are connections um, 
in, in the exile communities. They're living in the same spaces in Spain, in the Netherlands, in Italy. So there will, will have been connections between them. I'm just yet to uncover them, but it's uh, certainly an area where there's potential growth for this topic. Okay, there, um, well, uh, there is, um, have you found, Simon asks, have you found any links between the Jesuit and the Jesuits and the Recusants and Owen's uh, network? Yes, there's um, a huge, huge number of links between them, uh, particularly the Jesuits and this network. Um, the there were Jesuits in England in particular, um, quite a number of them, led by the, uh, the prominent figure Robert uh, Parsons, um, they had a very pro-Spanish agenda. They uh, believed from a religious perspective, they were hardliners, believing that you have to, um, um, you must fully commit to the faith, you, there can be no compromise when it comes to um, attending Protestant services, um, for example. But they also looked to Spain um, for, um, for support. And this, um, this network run by Owen worked in close collaboration with the Jesuits. Um, they, um, they shared a similar agenda. They shared information with the Jesuits. And you can see, um, so for example, Robert Parsons, I mentioned that he wrote a lot and um, produced documents and books uh, promoting the Jesuit Catholic agenda. And quite often these books include intelligence which has been gathered by this network um, about what was going on in England. Um, so there are, there are a huge number of links between those groups. Good. Um, you've mentioned, uh, Mark McKinty asks, you mentioned the destruction of Ireland in terms of troops being redire redirected there, but is there anything else to note either positively or negatively in terms of Ireland and Scotland in the wider picture? In terms of Ireland, the main thing going on there is the Irish, um, the uh, Tyrone's Rebellion or the Nine Years War, um, where Irish um, were rebelling against Elizabethan rule with the support of Spanish troops and money, um, helping, helping fund this campaign. Um, so they provide this big distraction and it's following a similar logic to that which uh, motivated the English to um, fight in the Netherlands. It's uh, f you, you provide support to the Dutch rebels and it forces England, um, forces Spain to focus on dealing with the Dutch revolt rather than dealing with England. Spain supports Ireland to distract um, England and English resources from fighting in Spanish territories. Um, so there's, that's a big part of this conflict. Um, the Anglo-Spanish War has to be seen as part of a wider conflict. In terms of Scotland, what I haven't talked about today is the question of the succession, the question of who would inherit the throne upon Elizabeth's death. As this was a disputed topic, um, Elizabeth refused to name a successor. Um, she preferred to leave the um, uh, question open because it meant that she had a greater uh, control over those who would like to be named a successor. They would have to suck up to her to curry her favour. Um, James VI of Scotland was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, um, Elizabeth's cousin, um, and he was by, um, by uh, blood the next in line. So there were those who looked to Scotland as the um, as the as, as where the next king would come from, and this brings Scotland into what's going on to a huge degree, because you want to know what um, James's religious attitudes are, what his policies are, and so on. So there are um, there are there is intelligence being gathered from Scotland and relating to this question of the succession. Yeah. Well, thank you. And as the last question, um, Freya asks, if you can recommend any good factual books to read uh, about this, she says she's read Dominic Green's book about Dr. Lopez and that it was excellent. Can you recommend any further reads for this? Well, part of the um, um, attraction of this topic um, 
for me was that it has hasn't really been studied before um, so there isn't really much out there already um, there's plenty which has been written about um, espionage in general particularly of England spies relating to Sir Francis Walsingham um, so looking the other way and then there's uh, plenty relating to um, English Catholicism in general and about um, Spain in general, but not really linking the two. Um, so on that front, um, it's a bit harder to recommend books um, directly linked to this topic. Good. Um, may I uh, then remind um, all of you that this will be online in YouTube uh, tomorrow for those of you uh, who are um, wishing to, to, to view some of the slides again. So it will be, you will be able to access this online, I think tomorrow already uh, via YouTube. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for sharing your brilliant research for us. Thank you very much to, to, to our audience and um, most heartfelt gracias to Jimmy, the president of the British Spanish Society, the trustees and, and the members of such an um, extraordinary institution linking both our countries. Buenas noches, muchas gracias.